When dealing with the terminology of teeth, you may come across the terms anatomical and clinical. So we're going to take a look at what those two terms mean. So one part of the tooth is called the crown. And so the anatomical crown is covered with enamel. So the anatomical crown is all of the tooth that is covered with enamel. enamel. Then the clinical crown is the portion of the anatomical crown that is visible. So the clinical crown is the part of the tooth that you see when you look in the mouth. So the ana anatomical crown is a formal definition. And the clinical crown is more of an informal definition because the anatomical crown is always going to be the same. There's always going to be the same portion of the tooth covered in enamel. However, the clinical crown could change a little bit because sometimes more of the tooth is going to be showing than others. Then there's the root. The anatomical root is the portion of the tooth that is covered with cementum. And Cementum is a bone-like substance that facilitates anchorage of the tooth in its bony socket. And the bony socket is called the alveoli. And then there's the clinical root, which is the portion of the anatomical root that is embedded in the jaw. So again, here you have a more formal definition. This is always going to be the same, the anatomical root. It's always going to be the part of the tooth covered with cementum. However, the clinical root could change because in a patient with advanced bone loss, the clinical root may be reduced in size. And then also, someone may have a receding gum line. So when someone is younger, the clinical crown might be kind of small, but as they get older and the gum line recedes, then the clinical crown is going to become bigger. However, the anatomical crown is going to be the same because it doesn't matter how much of the tooth is showing. And then we have the cervical line, which separates the anatomic crown from the anatomic root. Notice the cervical line doesn't have anything to do with the clinical crown and the clinical, clinical root. That's because that could change some. Whereas the cervical line is always going to be the same because the anatomic crown and the anatomic root are always going to be the same. Now, the cervical line is basically the junction between these two tissues, the enamel and the cementum. So another name for the cervical line is the cemento-enamel junction because it's where the cementum and enamel join together. So an abbreviation for the cemento enamel junction would be the CEJ. And then another name for this area is called the cervix of the tooth. And that is spelled C-E-R-V-I-X. So that's a look at the anatomical and clinical parts of teeth. Aerobic respiration. Let's look over here first. In aerobic respiration, respiration, step one is always glycolysis. And during glycolysis, you have two pyruvate and two ATP molecules that are formed. So that gives you a little bit of energy and the pyruvate to start the rest of the aerobic respiration process. So step one, glycolysis where you get the pyruvate and the energy that you need to keep going. So the next step is where our pyruvate is converted into two acetyl groups that are combined with coenzyme A to form acetyl CoA. And that's just an abbreviation letting you know it's the acetyl groups combined with coenzyme A. And we got this from pyruvate, which we got from glycolysis where some glucose was broken down. So let's keep going. Next, the acetyl CoA enters the matrix of the mitochondria. where it enters the Krebs cycle. And this is also called the citric acid cycle. So we've got our acetyl-CoA entering the matrix of the mitochondria. This is where it's going to take place. And then it enters the Krebs cycle. During the Krebs cycle, eight additional hydrogen-rich NAD NADH molecules and two additional FADH molecules are generated during the Krebs cycle. So we've put our pyruvate, we've broken down our, our pyruvate 
into two acetyl groups, combined them with coenzyme A. We've turned that acetyl-CoA through the Krebs cycle into these eight additional NADH um, hydrogen-rich molecules and the two FADH molecules. And now we're going to keep moving them. And, and the next step, these are reduced. That's going to be in the electron transport chain, still in the mitochondria. So, electron transport chain, um, these are reduced and the resulting electrons create a proton gradient. And these protons that have been created kind of cascade down the gradient and as they do that, in ATP synthase, um, they generate 30 or more molecules of ATP. So just imagine those protons cascading down and as they slowly fall down, they're generating energy and it can be 30 or more molecules of ATP that are generated. So let's look at all this in a diagram, maybe simplify it a little. So we've got our cell and nutrients are taken into that cell. In the nutrients, we're gonna get some glucose. And from one molecule of glucose, we are going to carry out glycolysis and get two ATP net energy over here, plus our pyruvate. And all of this happened in the cytoplasm of the cell. So we're inside the cell, but we're in the cytoplasm. But next, the pyruvate is going to go into the mitochondria. Singular mitochondrion. So it's just going in this one, and it's going to keep going in the acetyl-CoA that we got from the pyruvate is going to go into the matrix of the mitochondria and enter the Krebs cycle. During the Krebs cycle, we're going to get these molecules we talked about, our hydrogen-rich NADH and our FADH, and they're going to enter the electron transport chain. And as they are reduced, they form that proton gradient. The protons cascade down and generate 30 or more ATP molecules with some waste particles in the form of H2O, water, and carbon dioxide. So there are some waste products here, but oxygen went in because this is aerobic respiration. We got 30 plus molecules of ATP plus the two from glycolysis, so a net of 32 total. Now that could differ because the mitochondria has this membrane around it, and some energy can escape from the membrane and some energy can escape from the cell. So sometimes you lose some of that energy along the way, but on average you could get 30 to 32 net ATP molecules from one molecule of glucose. And then you do have some waste products left over. This is a really complicated process. Hopefully this has simplified it for you, but the primary reason that a cell is going to undergo aerobic respir respiration is so that it can get a lot of energy and expel some waste products. Enzymes. Enzymes are highly selective catalysts that greatly accelerate the rate of reactions. So they speed up how quickly a reaction takes place. Most enzymes are proteins, but some catalytic RNA molecules have been discovered. So there are RNA molecules that will catalyze reactions and help speed them up in the same way that these proteins will. And so they both work as enzymes. In enzymatic reactions, the molecules at the beginning of the process are known as substrates. During the reaction, these substrates are turned into different molecules known as products. And at the end of the reaction, the enzyme will be unchanged. The enzyme may have to change shape a little bit to bind to the substrate and finish the reaction, 
but the enzyme itself will be unchanged. It will not have turned into different products. It will not have gotten bigger or smaller. It will remain unchanged. Enzymes work by lowering the activation energy of a reaction, drastically reducing the reaction time. If you had to build up all that energy to complete a reaction normally, it would take a really long time. Well, whenever the enzyme works on a reaction, it lowers the activation energy and makes the reaction happen a lot faster. In fact, a lot of our metabolic processes would not be fast enough to sustain life without enzymes there to speed up the reactions. Enzymes are highly specific for their substrates. That means that each enzyme will only bind with specific substrates that fit with its active site. So each enzyme has an active site. Here we've got our enzyme to give you an example. This area would be the active site. So both here and here, this open area in the overall shape of the enzyme is the active site and each enzyme has an active site and only substrates with a similar shape that would be able to fit in there and bind without the enzyme changing shape too much will be able to fit with that enzyme and complete a reaction. So this would be your substrate and this is where the substrate would be coming into contact with the enzyme. Here you can see the enzyme and substrate have bonded and now they have formed the enzyme substrate complex and you can see that the enzyme changed shape a little bit to bind to that substrate and then in this next phase you have the enzyme product complex where the substrate has started to turn into two different molecules and separate from each other. And then in this last part, you've got your enzyme remaining unchanged and the products, two separate molecules that the substrate has been turned into, will leave the enzyme. So you can see the enzyme remained unchanged and the substrate was turned into two separate products. And going through this stage is going to lower the activation energy of a reaction. Enzymes can be affected by inhibitors, which are molecules that decrease enzyme activity, and they can be affected by activators, which are molecules that increase enzyme activity. So where you have enzymes that are raising the rate of speed of a reaction or lowering the activation energy needed, the inhibitors are going to slow that process down and the activators are going to speed that process up. So where the enzyme is acting on a chemical reaction, these other molecules can also interfere with the chemical reaction and either speed it up or slow it down. The main thing to remember about enzymes is that these are highly selective catalysts and they are going to increase the rate of a reaction by lowering the activation energy needed and at the end they are going to remain unchanged. Mitochondria. When you see the word mitochondria, you're looking at the plural form of the word. The singular form is mitochondrion. So whenever you see those, don't be confused or think you're looking at a different word. It's just the singular and plural forms. First, let's talk about the structure of mitochondria and then we'll talk about its functions. So the structure of a mitochondria. If you see it floating around in the cytoplasm, it kind of looks like a jelly bean. If you can see a cross cut out of it, then you're going to see this little squiggly membrane going through the middle there. So let's look at what each part of the mitochondria is. This outer layer that you can see is called the outer membrane. Next, this space in here between the outer membrane and this next line is called the intermembrane space. And then this next line is the inner membrane. 
So that makes sense, right? You've got your outer membrane, your inner membrane, and then the space between it is just the intermembrane space. Outer, inner membrane, intermembrane space, the space between the two. Next, you've got the space created through all these little zigzaggy patterns of the inner membrane and the spaces that are created here and in there and down in here between where it zigs and zags and you've got that space between each little fold. That is called the cristae. And then, last but not least, everything inside that inner membrane is called the matrix. So there you've got your structure of a mitochondria and the basic parts of it. And it's important to know that they are found in nearly all eukaryotic cells. So that's not all, but most eukaryotic cells. And that's going to be your larger cells, the ones you find in plants and animals. And within the cell, it's going to be found in the cytoplasm. So you will see mitochondria floating around in the cytoplasm. And you could have one or you could have lots of mitochondria. It kind of depends on how big the cell is. But the basic structure is going to be outer membrane, intermembrane space, inner membrane surrounding the matrix with the cristae forming in the folds between that inner membrane. Okay, let's look at the functions. Mitochondria produce adenosine triphosphate, which is known as ATP. So if you see ATP, it's an energy source and it's called adenosine triphosphate. But a lot of times this is not going to get all typed out. You're just going to see ATP because it's a very common abbreviation in biology. Now, ATP is produced through cellular respiration. which is also known as aerobic respiration. And that's because it involves oxygen. It's basically the cell's breathing cycle where it gets to take in oxygen and use it. So aerobic respiration or cellular respiration are basically the same thing. It just may, they may, whoever's typing or writing the paper or information you're looking at may use cellular or aerobic, but basically it's gonna refer to the cell taking in oxygen. Now, the set of reactions that produces ATP is known as the Krebs cycle. So, the mitochondria is involved in the Krebs cycle because it goes through some of those reactions to produce ATP. And the mitochondria is sometimes called cellular power plants or powerhouses because they create the cell's primary energy source, which is ATP. So since they create the primary energy source that the cell has to use, they are called cellular power plants. They also can regulate the cell's metabolism, and they are involved in cell division, cell growth, and cell death. So all of these processes require energy and since the mitochondria is producing the primary source of energy, it makes sense that the mitochondria would be involved in a lot of these processes. It has a lot of important jobs, but the most important is gonna be producing ATP because that is the primary source of energy for the cell and the mitochondria is what produces it. So it's very important to remember production of ATP, power plane of the cell, for mitochondria because that is what you're mainly going to see it associated with. Now it can also do these other things, regulating metabolism, being involved in cell division, growth and death, but main thing to remember is producing ATP. And you've got your structure, so remember outer membrane, intermembrane space, the space between the two membranes, inner membrane, cristae between those folds, and the matrix. Remember that mitochondria are going to be found in eukaryotic cells, and they're found in almost all eukaryotic cells, but not every single one. And most eukaryotic cells will have at least one, but they could have a lot of mitochondria, and you're going to find them in the cytoplasm. So just remember, if you're looking at a cell diagram, you're looking for that little jelly bean shape. 
And if you're thinking about what does a mitochondria do, think about producing energy, producing ATP. The mitochondria is your power plant of the cell. Proteins. Proteins are large biological molecules consisting of one or more chains of amino acids. which are known as polypeptides. So a polypeptide is an amino acid chain, not just an amino acid, but the whole chain of them connected. Now proteins have different structures based on how many of them are present. So the primary structure of a protein is its amino acid sequence. So just the one chain the one polypeptide chain and what sequence those amino acids are taking. The secondary structure is the regularly repeating local structures stabilized by hydrogen bonds. Now this is whenever we've got a few proteins interacting together and the local structures or the regular um, structures that these Proteins will form just all on their own without any help. And some examples would be the alpha helix, beta sheet, and turns. So those are just some different shapes that the proteins can take whenever there are a few of them joining together with hydrogen bonds. Now the tertiary structure is getting more complex. It's the overall shape of a single protein molecule. So enough proteins have joined together to make a whole molecule and the tertiary structure is referring to the spatial relationship of secondary structures to one another. So you've got your alpha helices, your beta sheets, and your turns, and it's how they interact together and what kind of shape they all form whenever they form into a single molecule. And you've got proteins joining together and then more proteins with hydrogen bonds joining together into a larger molecule and what that molecule looks like spatially. The quaternary structure is going to be the structure formed by several protein molecules. So you can see how we just keep adding proteins here to get different structures. And the more that are added, the more different that these um, structures are going to look because they're getting more complex. So several protein molecules are joined together in the quaternary structure, and this is usually called a protein subunit. So it's no longer one molecule, it's multiple molecules, so it's a subunit which functi functions as a protein complex. So it's going to be more complex, it's going to be able to process more complex functions. And a lot of the time what you're going to see is the quaternary structure of a protein because you have lots of them together and they are drawn toward each other and then they bond. Now let's look at some of the functions of proteins. We have structural proteins. And these give stiffness and rigidity to biological components that would otherwise be more fluid. They wouldn't have a lot of shape to them. An example is keratin. Keratin is a protein found in our hair, nails, um, in birds' feathers, and in animals' hooves. And it gives them a hardness that they wouldn't otherwise have. It's not a part of your body like your skin or an organ. And you can feel they're a lot harder than your skin would be. Um, like your nail and your hair don't feel the same as your skin feels or as your internal organs would feel and that's because they have this protein present that gives them more rigidity. So structural proteins are going to make things stiffer and give them a harder shape. Next we have enzymes and enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. So there's a chemical reaction that needs to take place, but it won't be able to take place until this enzyme is present. When the enzyme is present, it catalyzes the chemical reaction and speeds it up and lets it occur. Next, you've got receptors. Proteins that function as receptors bind a signaling molecule to induce a biochemical response. So it receives that signaling molecule and then it binds it somewhere that will induce the biochemical response that needs to happen. 
Next you have antibodies, which are also known as immunoglobulins. And these bind antigens and target them for destruction. So an antigen is a foreign body that comes into the cell and it's not welcome, it's seen as the threat, and so these antibodies or immunoglobulins are part of the immune system. And they bind to the antigens or that foreign body and they target them for destruction so that then they are destroyed and removed from the cell and the threat is eliminated. We also have motor proteins. And motor proteins generate the forces responsible for muscle contraction. So think about your motor functions, being able to move your muscles, being able to move around. All of those are, um, are able to happen because of these proteins, these motor proteins. So if you're able to move your arm back and forth, if you're able to close and open your hand, those are responsible, uh, those are happening because of muscle contractions and those muscle contractions are generated by motor proteins. If we didn't have those, we wouldn't be able to contract our muscles like we are. Next we have pump proteins. So these are proteins that act as a kind of pump and they transport ions or small molecules across a membrane. So you've got a cell membrane or an intercellular membrane and the po proteins can act as a pump and push these small ions or molecules across the membrane and that is their primary function as a pump protein is just to transport these small molecules or ions across the membrane. Lastly we've got switch proteins and these act as an on off switch based on the presence or absence of certain other molecules in the cell. So if a cell was waiting for a certain molecule to be present to do something then the switch protein is going to act as an off switch and keep the cell from performing that function until the certain molecule it's waiting on is present. Once it's present, it flips the switch and says basically it's on. It can perform this function now. So it acts as a, like an on off switch for the cell. As you can see, proteins are very important in a cell they actually can make up a large percentage of the components of a cell. For instance, you could have a cell that was made up of maybe 3% DNA, which is really important. You have to have the DNA encoded correctly for everything else in the cell to function. But the protein could make up almost 50% of that cell's components. So while it isn't maybe as biologically important as that DNA is, it makes up a big part of that cell and not much would be going on if it didn't have protein there as well because protein has a lot of functions. So you can see that proteins are very important for cell life and lots and lots of cell functions. Viruses. Viruses are tiny, non-living, biological, and infectious agents. So while they are not technically alive, they are biological agents and they are infectious. They infect healthy cells. They are going to consist of either a DNA or RNA genome encased in a protein coat known as a capsid. So this capsid is protecting the viral genome until it can get where it needs to go to infect a host cell. And it can only reproduce, this is viruses, they can only reproduce by infecting and taking over a living host cell. So while they are non-living, they must take over a living host cell to be able to reproduce their viral DNA or RNA. Now once they're inside a host cell, the virus may remain dormant for a while. So it doesn't always immediately enter the living host cell and attack. Sometimes it remains dormant for a while, but eventually it is stimulated into the active or lytic phase and the virus inserts its own genetic material into that of the host. 
So the host cell is unaware of this, and the DNA that is, um, or RNA that is mixed in with the host DNA or RNA, just, it doesn't recognize that right away. So the virus is able to take control of the host's DNA by mixing with it and then taking over it. It causes the, the host cell to produce many viral genes and proteins. So once it gets in there, it starts saying reproduce, reproduce, make more genes and proteins. And the ones that it are making, the ones that the cell is making are going to be new viral proteins and genes um, instead of the normal cells, genes and proteins. And then all of these viral genes and proteins combine to form new virions or virus particles that destroy the host cell and are released to infect other cells. So what happens is once the virus becomes active and it's in the lytic phase, it's going to insert its own genetic material into that of the host cell, so probably into the nucleus. The virus DNA or RNA is going to mix with the host DNA or RNA, take control of it, and then tell it to produce lots more of these viral genes and proteins, which combine to form new virions, and more and more are being made so fast that the cell can't keep up, and the cell is going to burst, or lice, which is where we get the lytic cycle, or lytic phase from, because it is whenever the end result is going to be the cell lysing, or bursting open. And once it bursts open, all these virions are released to infect other cells and go and repeat the process. Something to remember is that the genome of both DNA and RNA viruses can be either single or double-stranded. A lot of times a virus is going to not be too complex because the genome is only going to be three to a hundred genes. It's not going to be very big, but it can be double-stranded if it is a more complex virus. So viruses are sneaky little things. They're going to be protected by their protein coat, the capsid, and insert their genome, their genetic material, into a host cell, take over, reproduce more viral genes and proteins, which form so many new virions that it causes the cell to burst open and send out more viruses into the host to attack other cells. Catalysts are substances that speed up the rate of a chemical reaction without being consumed in the process. And so the way a catalyst works is first by lowering activation energy. And it lowers the activation energy that is required for a chemical reaction to proceed. And so by lowering that activation energy, the chemical reaction can proceed more easily. Now, another way that a catalyst meets its objective is by providing a surface for molecules to come together and to bind. And so to provide a surface for molecules to, to come together to bind is uh, faster than just random collisions of reactant molecules. So that is how a catalyst meets its goal of speeding up the rate of a chemical reaction. Now, we can classify catalysts as homogeneous catalyst and heterogeneous catalyst. So, a homogeneous catalyst is in the same phase as the reactants. So, say you have a liquid reactant and you have a liquid catalyst, then it's a homogeneous catalyst. Now, a heterogeneous catalyst is just the opposite of that. The catalyst is in a different phase than the reactants are. So, some examples of this would be 
Uh, take liquid bromine, for example, and it speeds up the breakdown of liquid hydrogen peroxide into liquid water and oxygen gas. So you have liquid bromine and you have liquid hydrogen peroxide. So those are in the same phase, so that's a homogeneous catalyst. Now, take for example the combination of ethylene and hydrogen gases to make ethane gas. It's catalyzed by adding powdered nickel. So you have powdered nickel, which is in solid form, and everything else is in gas form, or, or, the, or the gas phase. So in that reaction, nickel is a heterogeneous catalyst. So an important point to remember is that catalysts are substances that speed up the rate of a chemical reaction without being consumed in the process. Today we're going to go over three different forms of hypertension or high blood pressure. We'll begin with the first level, which is called essential hypertension. Essential hypertension is the most common form of hypertension. And the cause of this type of hypertension is unknown. Most patients are also unaware that they have hypertension when they have this level, the essential form of hypertension. They don't even know that they're suffering from it. Uh, usually it is only diagnosed in patients who have had three separate blood pressure readings of 140 over 90 or higher and it's clear that those high ratings are not due to some other medical condition or disease. So uh, normal reading, there's no other disease or medical reason. They have three separate occasions of a blood pressure reading of 140 over 90 or higher. They have essential hypertension. Most people are unaware of it until uh, it has been diagnosed in this manner. Um, secondary hypertension is the next level. Secondary hypertension only affects about 5% of those who have hypertension. Um, once they've been diagnosed with it, it's usually due, the secondary form of hypertension is usually due to some other medical condition, such as renal disease, uh, renal artery stenosis, uh, aldosteronism, and phaochromocytoma. These are the sorts of things that would lead to secondary hypertension. Finally, the third level is malignant. Malignant hypertension is uncontrolled, severe hypertension and is life-threatening. It can be due to secondary causes, renal artery stenosis, um, or there may be no known cause. But the blood pressure levels are so high that they have to be brought down safely but rapidly. So the goal with malignant hypertension is to provide immediate treatment by decreasing the blood pressure uh, over several hours. So no more than 25% of uh, lowered blood pressure over a one to two hour period. Uh, this is usually done with medication, such things as uh, nitroprusides, uh, nitroglycerin, um, clonidine, things like this are the most common medications used to treat malignant hypertension. Um, so remember the three uh, ones that we looked at today, essential hypertension, this is the one that most people have. They don't even usually know that they have it, but on three separate occasions they have a blood pressure reading of 140 over 90 or higher that is not clearly due to another medical condition or disease. Finally, secondary hypertension, 5% of people have that, and it's usually due to another disease, renal uh, disease, renal artery stenosis, things like this, and then uh, last is malignant hypertension, which is a life-threatening condition that needs to have immediate treatment by uh, various medications where the blood pressure is brought down slowly, no more than 25% over a one to two hour period. If you'd like to know more about hypertension and related issues, please click on the link beneath this video. It'll take you to a website that'll have more information and an ebook that's available for immediate download. Scientific notation. Scientific notation is a way to express very large, or very small numbers in the form a times 10 to the b, where a is a number between 1 and 10 and b is an integer. We're going to focus on this last part, 10 to the b, or 10 raised to an integer, first. 
So let's look at 10 to the first power. 10 to the first power is 10 times itself one time, or just 10. 10 squared is 10 times itself two times, or 100. 10 cubed is 10 times itself three times, or 1,000. And 10 to the fourth power is 10 times itself four times, or 10,000. Notice as our exponent increases, so does our place value of the result. As you increase your exponent, it's really like you're moving your decimal place one place to the right. Let's look and see what happens when we raise 10 to a negative exponent. To simplify a negative exponent, we're going to take the reciprocal, so we're going to flip it, of the number containing a positive exponent. So the reciprocal would be 1 divided by 10 to the first, or just 1 tenth. And one-tenth as a decimal is one-tenth. We'll do the same for 10 to the negative 2. So we take the reciprocal with the positive exponent, 1 divided by 10 squared, which is 1 divided by 10 squared is 10 times 10, which is 100, or 1 one-hundredth as a decimal. 10 to the negative 3 is 1 divided by 10 to the third power, which is 1 divided by 1,000, or 1 1,000th. And then finally, 10 to the negative 4, 1 divided by 10 to the fourth, which is 1 divided by 10,000, or 1 10,000th. And so we looked at this because with scientific notation, we would take a number like 3 times 10 to the second power. And what 3 times 10 to the second power is, is really 3 times 10 squared, which is 100. 3 times 100 is 300. Or what you can do is, since it's times 10 to the second power, you can take the decimal on 3 and just move it two places to the right. Since we saw that's what happened with our tens raised to the different exponents, we just moved the decimal one place to the right as our exponent increased. So we can take our decimal on three, which if you can't find one, it's at the end of the number, and move it two places to the right to get the answer 300. Three times 10 to the second power would be 300. Let's look at a number raised to a negative exponent, like 4 times 10 to the negative third power. So here, when we had 10 to the negative first, 10 to the negative second, etc., notice that our, our, as our exponents were decreasing, also our values were decreasing by one, by one decimal place each time. Our numbers got smaller and smaller and smaller, our decimal is moved one place to the left each time. So we're going to do the same thing with 4 times 10 to the negative third. It would be 4 times and 10 to the negative third we saw was this 1 1 thousandth. So it's like 4 times 1 1 thousandth, which is 4 times 1 1 thousandth, which is four thousandths. And the other way to do this is just to take that to the negative three, take that power, and this negative third power just means to move your decimal three places to the left. So we would take our four, and our decimal is behind it, and just move it one, two, three places to the left, which is the same result we got by doing it the other way.
The brain is one of the most important parts of our nervous system and today we're going to go over the various parts of the brain and talk about some of the ways they contribute and help in the areas over which that part of our brain control. And so we're going to begin then with the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe controls our emotions, our judgments, and our motor aspects of our speech and is also the primary motor cortex for voluntary muscle activation. Uh, after the frontal lobe we have the parietal lobe which receives sensory information from touch uh, proprioception which has to do with our um, ability to tell where our arms and legs are and our orientation in space so even with your eyes closed you know where your arms and legs are you have a sense of your body this is proprioception uh, the parietal lobe helps govern that also our sensation of temperature and pain um, that's the parietal lobe then the temporal lobe is responsible for our hearing, auditory information, and our language comprehension. The occipital lobe is our center for visual information, our sight. Uh, the cerebellum coordinates all of our muscle function. And then we have the brain stem. And within the brain stem, we've got the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. Uh, the brain stem is, um, governs our breathing, our respiration, our uh, hearts, our cardiac center, and uh, all the nerve pathways to the brain come through the brain stem. And then finally, uh, moving on then from that to the uh, diencephalon, which is the thalamus, subthalamus, and hypothalamus. Uh, the thalamus helps integrate and relay sensory information from the face, our feelings there, our retinas, our cochlea from our ears, our taste receptors and interprets sense, uh, sensation of touch, pain, and temperature. So our thalamus is very important to not only um, our sense of what we feel in terms of pain, temperature, touch, uh, but also our retinas, our eyes, our cochlea, and our ears, and our taste and our tongue. The hypothalamus controls the autonomic nervous system and the neuroendocrine system. It maintains our body homeostasis, helps regulate body temperature, uh, helps regulate our appetites, um, governs our thirst and how we feel that, our sleeping cycle, and hormone secretions. So once again, the brain, a uh, very um, integral, necessary, core part of our nervous system, broken up into these various regions and what they controlled. If you'd like to find out more about the brain and its relation to our nervous system, I encourage you to go to the link that you'll find below this video. Uh, at that website, you'll find a ebook that is uh, ready for immediate download. When we think about our pulse, it's something that many of us take for granted. We know we have one, we're alive, uh, but we don't think about it much. And so we're going to go over a few things related to pulse today. And by answering a few questions, what is a pulse? Basically, when the left ventricular pumps blood into the arteries, their elasticity causes them to expand as they receive the oxygenated blood. And this expansion then is called pulse. The pulse should be rhythmic and known to be such, uh, felt to be such, seen to be such. What is a normal pulse? Well, the average normal pulse is between 70 to 80 beats per minute. Now, there are things that can affect normal pulse. Uh, the average person has between 70 to 80 beats per minute, but beta blockers can uh, affect a pulse. Someone with hypertension is going to have a higher pulse rate. Those with hypotension or those who are in very good physical health can have a lower heart rate. Some of them as low as 60 beats per minute can be common if they're exceptionally fit, a resting heart rate of 60 beats per minute. So we know what a pulse is as the left ventricular uh, contracts and pushes blood out to the arteries. The arteries expand and it's this expansion as they receive the blood that's called the pulse as the heart keeps pumping the blood. Um, we know what a normal pulse is. Now where would you find the pulse? Uh, there are many places uh, to check for a pulse, but the best place to look and sense a pulse is where an artery lies on top of a bone so that you can then press on the artery over the bone and feel the blood as it's pumped by there. Um, basically, uh, the palpitation of an artery uh, over a bone is the best place to check, and the pulse is strongest and easiest to, easiest to detect in the arteries that are closest to the heart where the blood's coming out. Common pulse checkpoints then. We think first of all, very commonly, of the wrist. When taking a pulse, you need to use your index finger and middle finger, place it on the artery, over the bone, and apply light pressure. 
you certainly don't want to apply so much pressure that you're actually stopping the blood flow, but light pressure there to feel for it. Never use your thumb to do this because your own pulse rate in your thumb will interfere with feeling the pulse rate of the person you're trying to determine uh, whether or not they have a pulse and at what rate their uh, pulse rate is. So at the wrist on the radial artery is a common place where these fingers are placed and felt uh, over the wrist bone. At the medial inside of the biceps on the brachial artery is a place that can be checked. And then one that we see a lot in TV and movies, of course, is on the neck, just outside the larynx at the common carotid artery. So again, the two fingers press there uh, with pressure enough to feel the pulse, but not so much that you're cutting off blood supply. Uh, then the way you determine someone's pulse rate is you don't have to feel it for a full 60 seconds. You basically hold your fingers there over the artery, counting their pulse for about 15 seconds, and then you multiply by four and this will give you their average pulse rate. So we've answered the question of what pulse is, what a normal pulse rate is, where and how you determine pulse, uh, these common places of wrist, bicep, and neck, and then how long you need to actually feel someone's pulse in order to get their uh, beats per minute. If this is something you'd like to learn more about, then please click on the link underneath this video. It'll take you to a website where you can get more information. And on that website, you'll also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. Absolute zero is the temperature of zero degrees Kelvin. But I first want to look at how we get to that temperature. All right, so kinetic energy of a gas of gas molecules causes motion and is measured by temperature. And when gas is cool, the kinetic energy of the gas molecules decrease, hence the temperature decreases. So let's go back up here. All right, so the kinetic energy of gas molecules causes motion. So it's the kinetic energy that makes things move, and this is measured by temperature. So it's not the temperature of something that causes something else. It's when gas molecules are in motion, we measure that amount of motion by temperature. Now, think about gas as cooling. Now, don't think about it in terms of temperature. Don't think about it in terms of degrees. Just think about gas as cooling. They're losing heat. So when gas is cool, the kinetic energy of the gas molecules decreases as well. Now, what did we just learn about the kinetic energy of gas molecules? They cause motion. So if the kinetic energy of the gas molecules are decreasing, then the motion is decreasing as well. And then because of that, temperature decreases because the motion is measured by temperature. So if you think about molecules moving around and you can decrease the amount of motion they have, well, eventually, doesn't it make sense that at some point the molecules wouldn't be moving at all? Well, if the amount of motion of molecules is measured by temperature and the molecules aren't moving at all, and what would the temperature be? It would be zero degrees. So that's how we get to absolute zero. Absolute zero is when the kinetic energy of a molecule is zero. And because the kinetic energy is zero, then molecular motion stops. And we measure molecular motion in temperature. So when molecular motion stops, we measure it in absolute zero which is equal to zero degrees Kelvin, K stands for Kelvin, or negative 273 degrees Celsius. Now, I didn't use Fahrenheit here because in science, we don't use Fahrenheit very often because that's not as important. So here we just have it in Kelvin or in Celsius. So zero degrees Kelvin or negative 273 degrees Celsius is absolute zero. And when that's when kinetic energy of the molecules is zero, and therefore molecular motion stops. Now, nothing can be colder than absolute zero because temperature is a measure of motion. And all motion ceases at absolute zero. So because the motion has all ceased and stopped, the motion can't stop anymore. So that's why absolute zero is absolute because you cannot get any colder than that. Amino acids consist of a central carbon atom bound to four groups. Now, in every amino acid, three of those groups are always going to be the same. They're going to be made up of hydrogen, amine, and a carboxylic acid. So it's the fourth group that is going to differ 
in the 20 naturally occurring amino acids. And so this fourth group could also be called the designated R. And so R basically just stands for any type of chemical chain. And so I'm just going to write here, it differs. Because like I said, although three of the groups are going to be the same for every amino acid, the fourth group is going to differ from amino acid to amino acid. So we can classify amino acids into five different groups. And so we're going to take a look at those classifications. So the first is nonpolar, which is where the R's are mostly alkyl groups. And so that's like alanine, valine, and leucine. And then we have the polar group, which is where the R's are oxygen and hydrogen and a double bond between carbon and hydrogen, but they are not charged. So that would be something like serine, glutamine, or praline. And then we come to the aromatic amino acids, which is where the R's are rings. And so this is phenylalanine, tyrosine, those are some examples. And then another group is what we, would, what we would call positively charged, or we could also call this basic. And by basic, I don't mean simple. I mean the opposite of acidic. And so here the R's are amino groups like lysine and arginine. And then last but not least, the fifth group is basically the opposite of this. So it's negatively charged or we could call it the acidic group. So here the R's are carboxyl groups and so an example of that is aspartate. So that's a look at the five different classifications of amino acids. We can define energy as the capacity to do work. And we could further define energy as a scalar quantity. And so when I say it's a scalar quantity, that means it's kind of like mass. It has a particular number and unit associated with it, but it doesn't matter in which direction the energy was applied. Now, a unit for energy is the joule, um, which is actually has a little j, but then when we abbreviate it, it has a capital J. So to give you an idea of the unit joule, one joule is the amount of energy used to apply a force of one newton over a distance of one meter. So notice here that it applies both force and distance to come up with one single unit. Now you may be thinking, I said this was a scalar quantity, so direction didn't matter. Well, that's true, because say you're pushing a box and you give it one newton of force, it does matter how far you pushed it, but it doesn't matter whether you push that box north, south, east, or west. So that's what we mean when it's, we say it's a scalar quantity. It matters how hard you pushed it, but it doesn't matter in which direction you pushed it. Now some other units for energy are watts, calories, there's several British thermal units that uh, for energy, kilowatt hours, which is used specifically for electricity. Now, energy and work represent a force acting over a distance. So I'm going to say that again. It represents a force acting over a distance. And so when we think about work, we may think about just doing some, some type of physical activity or going to the place of work. Well, we have a physics definition for work, and that means to move something over a certain distance. And so if I pushed on this wall and I pushed really hard, I pushed all day, but the wall never moved, I didn't do any work by the physics definition. Now, if I were to look at a big box on the ground and think, I want to I move it across this parking lot, so I just push and push on it and slide it across the ground. Now I'm doing work because I'm moving that box. You have to move something. And so remember I said energy, or, or the unit we use for energy, which is a joule, is one newton over a distance of one meter. So we notice here that distance is important. Because if I apply a force of one newton on the box for one meter, I did quite a bit of work. But if I apply one newton of force over a distance of two meters, I'm doing even more work because it's I'm pushing it even further. And so I used more work. And so energy is the capacity to do work. 
It's the ability to do work. It's just like if you get a good night's rest and you eat a lot of food, then you're going to have more energy to be able to do work than if you haven't eaten anything in a while and if you're pretty sleep deprived. So you have this more energy, you have more ability to do this work. And so if I push the box with a force of one newton over a distance of two meters, I use more energy than if I push the box with a force of one newton for only a distance of one meter. So you can see here the relationship between energy and work. Now I'm going to draw a little bit of a, a box right here to talk about the relationship between energy and mass. And so we have an equation, which is E equals M with a little o, C squared. So E is obviously energy. And then we have M, which is mass. But in this case, notice it has a little o, which stands for the mass of the object. And then finally, we have C squared, which is the speed of light in a vacuum. The speed of light in a vacuum. So that's the way that you can relate energy to mass. So you're looking at the mass of a particular object, and then you use this, the speed of light in a vacuum, which is going to be a constant. And you're able to relate these two variables back and forth to each other. So again, energy is the capacity to do work. The three laws of thermodynamics are important to our understanding of energy and heat. So I've written each law up here on the board, and then under each law, written a brief summary of that law. So the first law of thermodynamics says that energy is always conserved. So take, for example, when I rub two, my two hands together. So I'm rubbing my hands together. So I'm exerting energy to rub my hands together. So it would look like my body is losing energy because I'm having to exert that energy to rub my hands together. But because I'm rubbing my hands together, I'm creating friction, which creates heat. And I can feel my hands getting warm right now. So although energy is coming out of my body to rub my hands together, it's changing forms into the form of heat. So heat is another form of energy. So energy is always conserved. It may change forms, but the energy is always there. You can't destroy energy. The second law of thermodynamics is that a system will develop a uniform temperature. So say I had a box, and inside that box I had two blocks of metal, and the blocks of metal were of equal weight. The first block of metal weighs 100 degrees, and the second block of metal weighs, um, the first block of metal is 100 degrees, and the second block of metal is zero degrees. So eventually, those two blocks are going to balance each other out until both blocks weigh 50 degrees. So that's basically the second law of thermodynamics, that, all, that both blocks in the box are going to work together to find one temperature, an equilibrium, a temperature that each, box, each uh, block is going to have. So this can be applied to many different things, any sort of system that you have where you have different um, objects inside that system and they have different temperatures. Eventually, all the objects in that system are going to have the same temperature. The third law of thermodynamics is that entropy becomes constant as temperature approaches zero. Now, this doesn't really make sense unless you know what entropy is. Entropy is the flow of heat. So as the temperature approaches zero, the flow of heat becomes constant. So that's a look at the three laws of thermodynamics and how they affect our world. A molecule is an electrically neutral combination of two or more atoms of the same or different elements joined by covalent bonds. So I want to go ahead and break down this definition a little bit to make sure we really understand it. Notice up here it says that the molecule is electrically neutral. So that means it has no net charge. So any positive or negative charges in that molecule cancel each other out so there's no net charge. In other words, it's neutral. Now, it's a combination of two or more atoms. Now, so this could look like this. Two hydrogen atoms or one oxygen atom and one hydrogen atom together would work as well because they have to be of the same or different element. So either one of these works as a molecule. Now, these are some really simple examples of molecules. And so molecules can be simple like those right there, or they can be as complex as large biochemical macromolecules such as proteins, 
starches, and cellulose. Now, proteins can range in size from 50 to more than 2,000 amino acids linked by peptide bonds, while starches and cellulose molecules can consist of more than 10,000 smaller glucose molecules covalently linked together. Now, there are some substances out there, three in particular that I want to highlight, that you may think are molecules which actually are not classified as molecules. So I want to go over those. So one is aggregations of polar molecules joined temporarily by hydrogen bonds. Another example is electrically charged ions joined by ionic bonds. And then finally, metals consisting of positively charged ions in a sea of delocalized electrons. So these three substances that I just listed, you may be inclined to classify these as molecules, but they actually are not. So I just wanted to warn you about those. So let's just review the definition for molecules again. That's something that's electrically neutral of two or more atoms of the same or different elements, and they're joined together by covalent bonds. So remember all these things. They're neutral. There has to be two, but there can also be more. Same elements or different elements. And they have to be joined by covalent bonds. So generally, when you have a definition of something, it just usually is maybe twofold. Here, there's lots of different criteria something has to meet in order to be a molecule. So you want to be able to remember all these so that you can see a substance, learn a little bit about it, and be able to identify if it is indeed a molecule. The periodic table is a way to systematically display the chemical elements. Now notice I said that it consists of chemical elements, and it consists of elements only. So to this, this does not include uh, mixtures and compounds, because an element is basically matter in its most basic form. The periodic table positions chemical elements based upon atomic number. An atomic number is the amount of protons an atom has in its nucleus. So hydrogen is the first element on the periodic table because it has one proton in its nucleus. And then the next chemical element has more protons in its nucleus. Like I said, the periodic table arranges chemical elements very systematically. So if you were to take a look at one row on the periodic table, all the chemical elements on that one row would have the same number of electron shells. And if you were to take a look at one column, all the chemical elements in that column would have the same electron configuration. So the periodic table arranges the elements in such a way that all the elements are next to similar elements. So if a scientist knew a lot about one element, he can know a lot about the elements around it just because all the elements are grouped together with similar elements. There are about 118 elements out there, but only 114 have been officially recognized. And 98 of those are natural elements, ones that naturally occur in nature, such as potassium, nickel, and hydrogen. The other ones are synthetically produced by humans, such as Einsteinium. So the important thing to remember about the periodic table is that it consists of chemical elements and it is arranged by atomic number. pH is basically a measure of how many hydrogen ions are in a substance. pH is very important to many fields such as biology, chemistry, medicine, food science, farming, and water treatment. I've written up here on the board a pH scale ranging from numbers 0 to 14 each indicating the amount of pH in a substance. Now there are pHs that go higher than 14, but for practical purposes, this is the largest pH scale we need. Water has a pH of 7, and any substance with a pH larger than 7 is considered a base. So everything from 7 over to 14 is considered a base. Common bases that you probably know of are baking soda and bleach. Now any substance with a pH below 7 is considered an acid. Some of those that you may know of are lemon juice, um, tomato juice, and gastric acid. So water is kind of the middle bar on the pH scale, and anything to the right is the base, and anything to the left is an acid.
I want to take a look at the properties of solutions and some different types of solutions. But first off, we need to define what a solution is. And it's a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances in a single phase. So by homogeneous, we mean the same. In other words, you don't have two substances somewhat mixed together. They are completely mixed together, forming one substance or one solution. And they're in a single phase. In other words, they're either all the components of the mixture are either in liquid, solid, or gas form. They're not in different forms. So every substance in the mixture is combined together to be the same in the same phase. And in the case of a solution, the particles are distributed uniformly throughout the volume and the molecules do not react chemically with each other. So in any solution you have two parts, the solvent and the solute. Now like we said, a solution can be made up of two or more substances, but here we're just going to pretend that there's two substances. So we have the solvent and the solute. We have one solvent and one solute. So consider water and sugar. So the solvent here would be water and the solute would be sugar. So the solvent is what is dissolving something and the solute is what is being dissolved. So if you were to put sugar inside water, water would be the solvent because it would dissolve the sugar and the sugar would be the solute because it's being dissolved. Now like I said earlier, when you put sugar into water, the sugar is not going to stay in there. You may go to the bottom at first, but if you stir it around, eventually the water is going to break down those, those sugar, the little pieces of sugar, until the sugar is completely dissolved and the sugar is going to be distributed uniformly throughout the volume. If you were to take a teaspoon of that water, there would be a certain amount of sugar in that water. And if you were to take another teaspoon out of that water, there would be the same amount of sugar in that section of the water because the particles are distributed uniformly throughout the volume. And now notice that the water was in liquid form and the sugar was in solid form. But notice that they're in a single phase now. The sugar has become liquid form. And then we also we said if they form a homogeneous mixture. There's not some pieces of sugar in some water. The sugar has now been completely dissolved in the water. So now you just have sugar water as a whole. And then also the water and sugar are not reacting chemically with each other. Now there are three different kinds of solutions gaseous solutions, liquid solutions, and solid solutions. And now the name associated with each kind of solutions des um, describes the phase of the solvent. So in the case of a gaseous solution, the solvent is in the gas phase. And in a liquid solution, the solvent is in the liquid phase. And then, I'm sure you're getting the picture, in a solid and solid solutions, the solvent is in the solid phase. And then the solute can be in any phase. So that's just three ways to classify a certain type of solution. But the important thing to remember, if you just take one thing away from this session, is that a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances in a single phase is what we call a solution. The three classical states of matter are solids, liquids, and gases. So first we're going to look at solids and we're going to look at some of the characteristics of a solid. So solids have a definite volume and density. So we would say they have a definite volume and density at a given temperature and pressure. So like this whiteboard, for example, is a solid. So the volume of this whiteboard isn't changing and the density of this whiteboard isn't changing. And then the second point of a solid is it has a degree of structural rigidity and a constant shape. So notice that this whiteboard has structural rigidity and a constant shape, so the shape isn't changing. It also has a resistance to flow. Now, some solids, such as modeling clay, can flow and undergo deformation under pressure. So I'm just going to write here, there are exceptions, but for the most part, solids have a resistance to flow. Now, the second state of matter is the liquid. And like solids, at a particular temperature and pressure, it has a definite volume and density. So the reason I say at a certain temperature and pressure is because at a different temperature and a different pressure, this whiteboard may have a little bit of a different volume and a little bit of a different density. But as long as it stays at the same temperature and pressure, 
then it's going to stay the same. The volume and density are going to stay the same. The same thing with the liquid. Now, a liquid does flow readily, so that makes it a lot different than a solid. But it does not expand to fill a container. So it's going to, to flow readily. If you spilled water on the ground, it wouldn't all just stack up in one spot. It would flow all over the place. Well, if you were to pour water into a glass, the water isn't going to expand to fill up that whole glass. It's going to keep the same volume. Now that's different than the third state of matter, which is a gas, because the, the main thing about a gas is that it will expand to fill a container. So all of a sudden if a gas was exposed in this room, it wouldn't all stay in one spot. It would eventually move to fill the entire room. Now the molecules are spread much farther apart and they move more rapidly and randomly than in a liquid. So basically the molecules move the slowest in a solid, they move a little faster in a liquid, and then they move the fastest in a gas. And so that's why gases are, are spread apart, it's because they're moving around so much and bumping into each other and pushing away from each other. And a liquid can, has more uh, movability to it, I guess if that's a word, it can move more because the molecules move more. And then a solid, you think about ice, it's not really doing anything, it's just sitting there because it's a solid and the molecules are moving really slowly. And so a gas is far more dispersed than even a liquid because it'll expand to fill an entire container. And so that's a look at the three states of matter. We want to briefly today go over the wall of the human eye. The human eye has a wall that's made up of three layers, an outer layer, a middle layer and an inner layer. They each have a different name and a different function. We're going to go over those briefly. So we'll begin with the outer layer of the eye wall called the sclera. The sclera is here in the outer wall of the eye and it is for protection. The cornea, the front of the eye, is actually attached to the anterior portion of the sclera, both top and bottom. I've only drawn in a representation of the top. And the cornea's job is to refract light that enters from the outside in order to put it through the lens and eventually put it onto the retina to allow vision. So the outer part of this three-tiered uh, system of the uh, wall of the eye is called the sclera. And it's primarily for protection and anchors and holds the cornea. The middle layer of the eye wall is called the choroid. The choroid's job is basically to keep the inside of the eye dark. Uh, you're trying to receive light from the outside for vision. You can't have light coming in from all sides. It's got to come through a very narrow and small area. And so basically you've got a protective layer, a layer that creates darkness, and then you've got an inner layer. And this inner layer is called the retina. The retina, receiving the light coming in through the cornea, uh, is responsible for um, communicating color and to the optic nerve and therefore giving us vision. So within the retina, you've got both rods and cones. The rod's job is to take low light, colorless environments and to help us see. And the cones are for our color vision. I happen to be red, green, color deficient, so my cones are messed up and I have a very difficult time distinguishing red from green. Um, Christmas tends to be a very boring holiday for me with all these different shades of brown, essentially. So I get asked all the time, how do you see colors? It's hard to describe, I do see colors, but I'm deficient in being able to distinguish reds from greens. They are very similar to me. But anyway, this has just been a basic overview of the eye wall and its three divisions, the outer, middle, and inner, sclera, choroid, and retina. If you'd like to learn more about this or related things, underneath this video, you'll find a link. If you'll click on that link, it'll take you to that website that has an information. And while you're on that website, you'll also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download.